Welcome to another episode of Tradecraft Tuesday. I hope you're ready to get crafty because we are going to dig into some real tradecraft. So first and foremost, welcome back. If you've been here before. If you're new, welcome. We do the show uh, every month, second Tuesday, right? I think I'm not crazy with that. It is the second, you know, usually Patch Tuesday, or at least when Patch Tuesday was second Tuesday. It's uh, a thing. <laughs> yeah. I, I secretly was hoping, Chris, though, with your introduction, though, about getting crafty, you were going to turn it into one of those, like, you know, <laughs> three-minute TikTok videos or whatever on, like, here's how to, that's what we're really doing yes. today. <laughs> it's a crafts time with Huntress. So uh, those that attend know that we regularly kick off with the news, but as we started building this episode, uh, we realized that there was no room for news in this. It's just too big of a story, too big of the intricacies and for some of our audience, they're going to be you know, hearing this, some of this for the first time. And our more technical part of our audience is going to want to understand the nitty gritty. So um, we've presented this in a way that I think we're going to be able to provide best of both worlds. Chris, do you mind if I, I mean, I, I prepared some beautiful looking slides for you. Yeah. You, you want me to, uh, go for it. to to reference those? Yep. While uh, do... So oh, I was go just going to say, make sure everybody... Some of you obviously heard it before, some are, some are here new. Um, when you're chatting, make sure you're selected all panelists and attendees. It's more fun that way for everybody. Uh, everybody kind of gets to join in uh, and things get a little raucous in the chat. Um, if you have questions, you want us to kind of clarify something we talked about, whatever, use the Q&A feature in Zoom. Um, that way the questions, they, they pop up in this side panel that we can see and we can know like what we've covered, who's answered what and that kind of stuff. So that really helps us. Um, but like Kyle said, uh, no news today. Let's get into it. Yeah. So, uh, the goal, right. Is more than just a quick overview for some of you, we're going to get you caught up, but it's really to dive into the trade craft. What's neat about this is it's always cool to hear about the headlines, who gets attacked. You hear Cisco department of treasury, you name it gets implanted, but it's way neater when you start thinking about what was this adversary considering either as they were writing the malware, how they were making sure they didn't get caught. How did they, you know, what data were they trying to target potentially? Who are they trying to get access to? We also threw in some, I, I'd call them closer to clickbait ones where you start talking about attribution, right? You know, everybody immediately wants to jump to, you know, it must be the Chinese or it must be the Russians, right? Or something along those lines. But we'll actually talk a little bit about what is the actor's tradecraft suggest you know, what this person is. Is it, you know, somebody that's just uh, a novice that's in a basement? Is it somebody that does this professionally? And lastly, we're going to open it up for questions. You know, that's always the part that goes really interactive. We just suggest throughout this, like start dropping the questions, start throwing it in chat. There's none of this that needs to follow. It's not a, you know, this is not a webinar, right? This is not come watch our PowerPoint slides. So it really is to learn. So if you've got something you want to dive into, please share it with us. Uh, with, that set, uh, with that said, guys, does somebody want to at least introduce what the heck is a sunburst? And there's all kinds of different words, sunburst, sunspot. I've got, you know, some, I don't know, the lack of sun, pasty sunburn. skin. Sunburn. Yeah. Did you get sunburned? <laughs> yeah. I, you know, I, is that what happens after the solar winds incident? You were, you were sunburned? <laughs> sun. uh, <laughs> like you need it. pretty strong SPF for that. Oh, yeah. gosh. That's. This is why, you know, nobody shows up to Tradecraft Tuesdays because we're terrible. Uh, <laughs> True. <laughs> all right. Somebody take it. Somebody introduce what the heck is this uh, sunburst thing in case you, you've never heard of it before. All right. Um, so sunburst, uh, if you haven't been following the news for the last month, was a, a backdoor or a compromised version of a DLL that was a component of uh, Sol SolarWinds Orion product. Um, this particular DLL, this malicious DLL, was actually digitally signed by SolarWinds and was being distributed by their systems via a patch to the o Orion software. Um, and it was basically masquerading its, the traffic that it was using um, as the Orion protocol. So it looked like it was operating as it should be. But in reality, it was collecting data about your systems, right. the, the victim systems. John, you I know knew what um, Orion was like, does like, what's it as a piece of software? What does it do? Yeah, I, I used to use like old school software on active duty, like HP OpenView, things to be able to tell me, you know, you know it was either sniffing SNMP back in those days, trying to tell me what's on my network, whether it was device inventory, what's roaming, what's not. Uh, John, did you use any of those, like What's Up Gold or any of those old school tools? I, I used or? What's Up Gold, but not Orion. <laughs> I was just trying to remember. I, I 
Right. Bottom line, tons of large businesses use it. Uh, at one time, I mean, I think sadly, right before this incident, as SolarWinds was preparing the split between SolarWinds and SolarWinds MSP, they'd even bragged about like, you know, the majority of the Fortune 500 use our software. So you could imagine somebody was licking their lips and was like, this sounds like the perfect supply chain backdoor. <laughs> um, but guys, how does this differ from the next one, which I, if I recall, Sunspot, there were some people that were like, I've heard of different words. I've also heard of, you know, backdoor web servers. How does this relate? So Sunspot's new. Sunspot just came out um, today, it was published in an article by uh, CrowdStrike. So basically CrowdStrike went in and did some investigation, trying to understand like, how did this happen? Um, did incident response on the build server. And they basically identified that there's a piece of malware that runs on the SolarWinds build server. So the build server is is what it sounds like. It's a server that builds the software. So they have all this software, all these different components, that server compiles them all down, generates a, an installer, and then that's what you use to install. Um, Sunspot is malware that ran on that server that would identify when that compilation was happening and identify when Orion specifically, the Orion component was being compiled and it would replace the files on disk with the malicious Trojan backdoored files, wait for that to be compiled and then reset them back to the original ones. Yeah, yeah, I, I think that's a, a really fair summary. And we're getting ready to dive. Well, I mean, this this analysis is going to go into source code. It's going to go into some of the actual triage that, you know, with the Huntress team, it started on kind of, I guess it was December 12th, 13th, and then 14th is when things really blew up between Sunday night and Monday. But I think it's easiest, guys, to, to maybe start with uh, what was the timeline? Because even though we could tell the story of like how we approached it, uh, it's a heck of a lot more clear when now we look at in hindsight, because we've, I mean, this was actually from SolarWinds blog just yesterday from their new CEO saying, hey, what is the timeline? How did things progress? And I think this does a pretty good job at it. So um, for those that aren't aware, uh, you know, this became news you know, to the point of almost everybody knew by about December 13th of 2020. But the story started September of 19. And for a lot of people, that's a, a that was kind of a shock uh, that, that it had gone so long. So what happened is back in September, early September, the actors got into solar winds. And what was neat is these actors were methodical. They didn't actually just go straight into, you know, if anybody's ever heard of me or my team pitch before, we say, look, even when we did offensive cybersecurity, you never just like smash and grab. You have to get in, you get the lay of the land, you figure out what to do, you do some testing, you do better reconnaissance. You know, it's never just wrapped up in a bow ready for you to, you know, for go time. Um, and that's exactly what happened here. Uh, we, we saw the actors do some test code, make sure that they could inject that sun, uh, you know, using that uh, sunspot injector to load in the malicious source code that got compiled and it got compiled with the sunburst malware. And then if you take a look at this timeline, they, I mean, months in between their test injections to the time that they decided, all right, we're going to deploy and ship the compiled version, the actual backdoored version of the Orion DLL. I mean, it was all the way from November to February. So when we talk about dwell time or kicking actors out of your network early, perfect example here. Not often do you get a retrospect and huge kudos to the SolarWinds team of sharing some of this. You know, this is how the whole industry learns. Uh, we see that the threat actor goes, we see that there is new hotfix DLLs available to customers that obviously when an update comes out, people update to the new updated version, yep. which yeah. solar winds out there pushing it, telling people update, get the updates. Yeah. Um, and then obviously the actors finally decided at their control in June, they decided, you know, you know what, I, I've got in. I've got what I accomplished. I've either moved on or maybe they were spooked, whatever it was, but at the actor's will, they decided to burn off and remove their malicious tools from, you know, uh, from the actual SolarWinds build system in June. Fast forward six months later, that's when this stuff happens. If you notice the SolarWinds, SolarWinds themselves get notified on December 12th. Uh, the Huntress team got an early heads up on this, only it, it was it looked like a, from timeline about 12 hours after the SolarWinds team was notified, um, just kind of incident responders sharing, notifying, you know, a lot of it being traffic light pattern red or TLP red. So, hey, only to be shared to protect, whether it's for clients or on limited basis. Uh, and then all of a sudden, everything became public by the 13th uh, to the to the 14th in a matter of two days, it went from nobody knew to everybody knew. 
And here we are where some of this stuff, new findings released quite literally yesterday. So it's been a whirlwind. But guys, I mean, do we, are we ready to start jumping into that trade craft and, and talking about how yeah. some of this work, Chris? Or how, how do you guys want to handle it? Because if so, yeah, I think so. maybe we can talk about that build system compromise. Because I think for a lot of people, you know, when this was going down, nobody knew how it happened. It was hypothesis, right? Yeah, I mean, so there were some indicators that basically would lead you to believe that the build server was compromised. I think you had posted like really early on that it was probably um, the build server or CICD type of process. Um, reasoning for that is the DLLs that were like pushed out were part of the installer and they were digitally signed with SolarWinds uh, signing certificate. So that signing certificate is like highly protected because anybody who has that can publish software as that manufacturer and that manufacturer has like really no repudiation. So when you see that and you see malicious stuff um, signed with that, you know really one of two things have happened. Either attackers have compromised their internal infrastructure, build infrastructure, whatever, or attackers have somehow stolen the signing certificate. Yeah, yeah, so that was pretty crazy. So it was even crazier to see like from hypothesis into the actual SEC form 8K, this is a form that's required, you know, as a publicly traded company to start doing some of the disclosure that they did confirm that there was source code where it hadn't actually been added to the source code repository, but something had appeared to it inserted into the build process. Fast forward now, obviously we know that that inserting was done by the Sunspot injector. So Chris, you had done analysis on some mm -hmm. of this stuff and this is just becoming public news in the last kind yeah. of 24 hours. Do you wanna talk about how the injection was working as we start getting into Tradecraft, um, how they were adding it to the source code without actually truly committing it to the repository? Yeah, so that was one of the things that we thought maybe early on, like maybe the attackers actually had access to their source code repository. It turns out not. So. I just posted a link to the CrowdStrike blog that I guess they published yesterday, um, where they actually did a technical analysis on the Sunspot malware. So what they found is that there's actually malware running on their build system. Um, it had a file name of task host SVC, and it was scheduled to run uh, with a scheduled task when the host boots. Um, nothing new here. Huntress has actually been detecting this kind of stuff, these persistence techniques since 2015. So we thought that was interesting. We'd throw that in here. But the way that the, the malware would work is it would monitor the processes to find when msbuild.exe was running. So for anybody who's not a developer, msbuild.exe is part of Visual Studio. It's what actually runs the build. So it runs, it collects all the files, it passes them to the compiler, it moves stuff around. Um, and so it controls that whole build process. And what their malware was doing is looking for when MS build was called to build the Orion component. And when that happened, um, what they would see is like, okay, we're building Orion. Let me copy my file the new file with the malicious code that I actually want to be part of this, it would overwrite the Orion uh, C sharp stuff on disk. That would get compiled and then it would replace the original file. So they didn't actually have to look at their source code. If any of the solar winds engineers pulled down the source code, this was not in there. The malicious yep. stuff was not in their source code repository. It was actually injected at build time. Um, and I can tell you from someone who is trying to build secure software, security products, this is one of the most um, concerning things you always have is your build server generates something, you need to be able to trust that because I, I don't have the time to like take the file that was generated by my build server and like reverse engineer my own code to see if stuff is there. So I really have to be able to trust that my build server is legitimate um, and this, you know, Sunspot completely undermines that. Yeah, uh, Derek in chat actually said, let's be honest, the build process is just so noisy. It's an obvious place to attack and this won't be the last one. Derek, when we get to the back half of this presentation, since the SolarWinds incident, there was just a massive supply chain incident on the M&A side of the mid-market company called Axial. Once again, the mm -hmm. Jenkins build server on this one was compromised to be able yep. to get access. So you are already leagues ahead of this presentation, man, but you, you nailed it. So um, it's a way Two to get it. Two interesting points there. Uh, you are right. It is a big process. There's all kinds of stuff going on. It is noisy. The attackers, actually, if you look at some of the code that they deployed, they went to 
above and beyond to try and make sure that there were no build failures caused by um, you know, anything that they injected or whatever. If you actually go back to the slides that Kyle was showing, at the bottom, you can see that there's a failure. Um, so it, the log, what, what was being showed here was the log that's actually output from Sunspot. So let's see uh, when it comes back up. Maybe we'll get it, maybe not. Um, but at the bottom of the log, there's a log entry that says failure. Um, and one of the things that they were, malware was doing was verifying that the file they were replacing had the contents that they expected. That way, if a change was made to that file by some engineers, they didn't overwrite it with their malicious file and cause a build failure because then the engineers are going to go inspect the build failure and figure out why is this failing on the build server but not here in my local. And so, um, you know, they went to extreme lengths to make sure that didn't happen. I saw somebody in chat had asked, um, do we need to be concerned about software signed with that signing certificate? Um, yes. They were on the build server. They were able to get stuff that was signed. The possibility that they were able to access the signing certificate and sign stuff is not zero. It's more than zero. So I would say, yeah, don't like consider any software signed with that old cert to be uh, potentially malicious. So Chris, no, uh, so, so sweet. So uh, making it, uh, you know, beat the system into shape. But there's your log there that highlights exactly yep. what you called there, of where that step four is going down and yep. where the failure so is going. See the inventory manager .cs file. Um, likely, it, it doesn't say why it's failing here, but likely that's failing because that file does not have the hash that the uh, Sunspot malware was expecting. Yep. Going on, Chris. I know uh, you know Microsoft in one of their earliest reports. So Sunday, the tw uh, on uh, Sunday, December thirteenth, there was a lot of folks who were aware. And as far as I was uh, clued in, I believe it was supposed to go public on Monday about this situation. Uh, fortunately or unfortunately, all things started flying around by I don't know mid afternoon, five eight p.m. or something like that. Everybody in the world knew that the Solar Winds incident was going on, and it wasn't just like FireEye or the Department of Treasury, it was, it, it was massive. So one of the things that Microsoft had pointed out and it kind of didn't get, uh, you know, if we go back to that timeline, this whole article here about, oh, hey, look, some of these DLLs, they called them at the time anomalous. They said, look, the class was added, but note that these do not have active malicious code. So that's what we were talking about in that test phase of the actor taking their sweet time. And they had shipped in October, two versions of the compiled DLL that were really just had test codes. So, um, you know, some people were trying to figure out what that is. You know, even us, if you take a look, here's me at 3.40 a.m. on Twitter trying to share with the rest of the community what was going on. And we had even, you know, found one of the DLLs from back in October. You know, it's always hard to look in hindsight after an incident happens because, you know, is that data there? Did you catalog it? And we ended up pulling it apart and confirming that this sucker was indeed one of those backdoored and if I recall, Chris, you actually were able to track down a copy this morning from the team at Reversing Labs actually showed what this looks like. So do you want to give a, you know, an introduction, Chris, of what this is? Because I know John on the next slide is going to talk a little bit about what were some of the jobs? What was inside the Sunburst source code when it wasn't the test code? Yep. Yep. So like Kyle was saying, there was this period of about a month um, based on identifying binaries that were shipped and what they had in it where they were shipping what we're effectively referring to as a test payload. Um, and so the, the question is like, wait, what, is a, what does a test payload mean? What does it do? It looks like attackers were actually trying to verify that what they thought was happening and, and that they thought that this was the legitimate production build system and that things were gonna be um, signed and deployed and all that, they wanted to make sure it was um, working. So they, they actually shipped some code, as you can see here in the screenshot, that's basically empty. So like the code is in there, the classes are there. There's really no functionality in this thing, but my guess is they injected that and they were waiting for those binaries to be shipped so they could download them and confirm, yes, we're able to actively inject into the code that is shipped. Yep. Um, so why would the attacker do this? The attacker's just really looking to make sure that what they, what they think is working is working before they go and do all kinds of crazy stuff. So uh, with, with that said, you know, a lot of folks said, okay, there's a lot of, remember, this is happening kind of initial access into solar winds, September, right? Early September, I think it was September 4th. 
Then to November, yep. you've got some of this code being shipped, delivered, October, November time period for the files based on the compilation timestamps. But then everything hits the fan December 12th, December 13th, December 14th. What was interesting is even by midnight on December 14th, we noticed that there was only one out of all the, the antivirus engines in virus total that were even flagging the DLL. It had all kinds of malicious capabilities. John, I know you on the threat ops team, you guys pull apart malware all day long. You wanna talk a little bit about the screenshot that's there on the right. What view is this? What tool was used in you know, a high level walkthrough of the you know, method names or the function names that this code had? Yep, so th since this uh, DLL is written in csharp.net basically, um, this tool, I believe, is a screenshot of DNSpy, which is a .NET uh, deobfuscator decompiler, and you can open up .NET executables and DLLs and navigate through them. So in this particular case, it's showing the job class up at the top, and this is the one that was added that has all these methods inside to do different things. So uh, the first one is collect system description. That was a, a data collection, um, getting details about the host, obviously some functions or methods to delete files, check if files exists, delete registry, um, which other ones? Uh, yeah, there's all kinds. Some yeah. of the funny ones, right? We're just reading the values, trying to figure out, reading its own configuration file, all these minor little things. And John, we typically refer this as a stage one implant or it's, you know, initial access. It might not have all yeah. the cool, sexy things for stealing your credentials out of memory or lateral movement, additional process injection, but it really is given you, I mean, for those who've ever used an RMM, like this is, uh, you know, this has got a lot of really basic functionality to get your stuff done. So um, doing the bare minimum, uh, you know, Chris earlier uh, used the word, he said, look, they were hiding in plain sight. You want to touch on that, John? And I'll bring up the slide a little bit of what this meant. Um, and obviously, Chris, feel free to add to about like how this was, you know, what it meant. You know, I mean, John saw those names. It's not like they had crazy looking hash name functions. It kind of looked like stuff the, you know, the Orion development team could have wrote. Yep. So they basically were reusing uh, function and method names that they had seen in other um, pieces of the source code and reusing those so they would blend in. So it didn't look obvious that it was uh, out of place where it was. Yeah. So some that, of the... That, oh, good. Sorry. I, I think that the hiding in plain sight or is the reversing yep. labs team called it, right? Not only to blend in with the rest of the code, but also, you know, keep in mind, this was not committed to the source code, but Chris was mentioned earlier when the injection happened, say for instance, something blew up and they needed to go be able to, you know, look at the build system, figure out what was going on. This wasn't only just to evade the team when they were, you know, looking at the source code repository, it was supposed to be able to withstand scrutiny, be able for somebody that was familiar with the code base would say, oh, these function names are in other, you know, SolarWinds code or other Orion code. Of course, this must be legitimate. So I found that was super impressive, like all the way down to like the naming schemes. Like if I recall, like some of the stuff was even like properly using camel case or Pascal case where it should have, the variables were named slightly different. I mean, they just really uh, took their time. Someone in chat said, hey, did they fix any other bugs, you know, while they were at it? I mean, they <laughs> I mean, they were good, right? They were real good. So Chris, I mean, you obviously is our chief architect CTO side of the house. I mean, with your team, you know, I've got two screenshots left and right, the legit yeah. code and some of the shady code. What's your quick analysis on some of this based on the way they named it? I mean, so if it's me, I'm, I'm scrolling through. If I'm like tearing down this file, trying to see, is there some malicious stuff here? Because this doesn't seem right. I have a trigger on any of these. Like none of these are sketchy named things. They follow the same kind of conventions. It just, it, it looks okay. The only way I'm really going to know is if I have some better indication of like, what is it doing tasking wise that looked malicious, right? Like John was just talking about some of those where it was like kill task, run task, whatever. If I know, or I have some indication that like, hey, Orion is like running things that I don't expect it to, then maybe I would zone in more on like run task or something like that. But uh but no, this would be very hard to detect. And I think probably the reason they did this was to um, avoid any potential detections by software doing like automatic decompilation and static analysis to say like, is there bad stuff here? Yeah, I always think about risk profile too, guys. So not only of getting caught from humans, but 
I mean, for instance, this one here, like part of writing malware is you often have to have a place to store your configurations, whether that covert store is unpacked in memory. Sometimes you put encrypted keys or blobs on disk or in the registry if you're kind of sloppy. These actors actually took their time. They would decode these randomized strings, this encoded string, and be able to actually look. They added to the legitimate XML configuration for the Orion you know, software. They added their own configuration files to be able to withstand scrutiny. So clearly this was not the report watcher retry value. This was something that was being parsed by the malware and leveraged here in this screenshot, but they just were quite solid at this stuff. So uh, guys, I think we've obviously built, beat the source code piece to death on these actors clearly took their time. They clearly knew what they were doing. Do we want to talk about what some of the stuff, like maybe how to evade, you know, whether they were running on, uh, you know, in the solar winds network or they were running on a target network. I think we could pivot there if you guys are okay with it. Yeah. Okay. So who wants to break this sucker down? You know, we've got this crazy function that's getting a hash and it's doing something on a process name to lower. What the heck are these actors doing with these process names? So in this case, these all these process names, they pre-computed the hash of the process name and that's where that number comes from. Um, I'm sorry. And they were specifically looking when these applications were running, they would cease to operate. So it would stop and say, uh, we need to, uh, so we don't get caught basically. All of these things are security products or you see auto runs, the, the inspiration for Huntress, somebody was uh, poking around and making sure that forensic examiners or incident responders aren't technically looking through the system and trying to figure out what's going on. Yeah, so yep. there's all kinds of these. Notice that, you know, I, I, I split this. This list was much longer. For anybody who's tracking, obviously we'll share some of this stuff or these links in the chat, but we have links to all the deobfuscated or, you know, decoded uh, hashes where people took the time to crack the hashes. Fantastic work here. But they even included security products and the security products had all kinds of them. Some were just looking at process names. Other ones were actually looking at like, what is the state of the service? Is it enabled? Is it disabled? Were they running? Chris, I mean, I saw stuff like they were looking to be able to tamper and disable. Uh, you know, obviously you have on this one Windows Defender that they were, you know, wondering, is it turned on? What capabilities are on there? But I recall, I thought I saw Azure Sentinel in there. In addition to it, I saw stuff like Sentinel One, CrowdStrike. Do you recall, did they also yep. do tampering? Did they try to turn those software off? <clears throat> yeah, actually, uh, Symantec published a blog um, on this where they actually talked about, um, they get into some of the DNS stuff, which we can talk about in a minute, but part of what was being reported back before the second stage would come down um, was uh, what security products are on the machine, what's the state of them, and was it able to disable them. So things that they were looking for is CrowdStrike, Carbon Black, FireEye, ESET, F-Secure, Microsoft Defender, um, so it would report back through some of its DNS queries, you know, is it, is it installed, is it running, and was it able to be disabled? So, um, you know, that's, that's how they were evading a lot of stuff. And, and that kind of goes back to, like, I put a note in here about, like, why did this take so long before it was found? These are why. So, so guys, I'm curious. So we've got these crazy looking obfuscated strings and I don't, do you remember what the algorithm was? FNA1 or FN1A, something like that? Uh, uh, FNV1A, I believe. Fa fancy, uh, you know, uh, geek talk, but long story short, guys, what about these? What I, I noticed in that source code, I noticed all these random hashes. Like, you know, there's obviously some real quick hypothesis, even as security analysts or IT analysts, you should be able to think like if you had access to the source code and you're seeing, they, they called it pattern hashes and that's all they named the, you know, in the source code. But it turns out they were storing way more than just process names and programs. They were storing what looked like all kinds of different domain names. So I, I'm curious, the audience or folks watching, any thoughts on why they would want to know like if swdev.local or swdev.dmz I, you know, I have a feeling that's probably Solar Winds development networks there. Um, you know, Derek threw in here and said internal domains for sure. Uh, Chris, what about you? If you were on the actor side of the house, why would you want your malware to be checking to see if these, you know, domains were present or if you were executing within these domains? Yeah, I mean, you probably don't want, 
you know, the last thing you want at this point is when you've compromised SolarWinds build server, you don't want anybody at SolarWinds to think that something is up, to think that something's not right, because then they're going to go start looking for stuff. So um, if our actual target is not solar winds, which it's clearly not, because if, if as an attacker, my goal is to get code into your installer that's going to be installed in the Fortune 500, you're not my target. You're just a vector for me to get to my target. Um, I don't want it to run in your environment because I don't really care about you. And the last thing I want is for you to be tipped that something is not right and then for you to go investigate or something. So um, in this case, it looks like they were just using the domain. So I would, I would assume when it starts up, the very first thing it probably does is try to figure out what domain am I in? If it's on this list, exit. Yeah, so I somebody DM'd, and this is bringing in uh, you know the slide from the actual SolarWinds blog we did earlier. The timeline, remember, we're going from November to the time we actually ship code in February. They asked, do you think they were doing this reconnaissance during that time frame, whether it's from September to February? I mean, think about that. This actor of what we're looking at, this actor took their sweet time in this network to understand not just the domains that they could within the development network, but take a look at all the regions. They mapped this network, APAC, right? Obviously some of the Asia Pacific networks there, understanding where could they end up? Where might this code start running? Because bottom line, they didn't want to get caught. You know, um, lab.na, is that lab.north America? Possibly. Is it the Bruno office, right? All kinds of these hypotheses and questions, but this actor didn't just know this, right? This actor got in and had to figure out the lay of the land. So once again, it's just another one of those big pieces. Um, so guys, do you want, you know, I can stop screen sharing for just one second. We've right now talked a lot about what's going on inside the malware, but let's be real. The actors, right? At the end of the day, they're in this, whether it's for reconnaissance, espionage, information gathering, they've got an end goal. And so things that are going to come up are like comms. How do they chat? How do they be able to move laterally? How do they install their malware? Um, do you want to give maybe some color, either Chris or John, on you know, what, what you guys are obviously hypothesizing. And then we have supporting, you know, material to be able to say, like, how did these communications even work? You know, if you guys were an actor, maybe to, to ask you one specific question, you know, you're going to have to exfil stuff out, right? Yeah. What, what type of protocols are you guys thinking of in advance as an actor? How do you want to get it out of the network? And then obviously I'll bring up the, some of the slides on comms. The typical so HTTP DNS. Yep. Uh, yep. stuff to just blend in with the rest of the network traffic. Yeah, what protocol you use is going to be heavily dependent on how much traffic you expect to get. Um, we've talked about previously in some in some previous uh, Tradecraft Tuesday about tunneling traffic over DNS. And in fact, the attackers did it here. They actually did tunnel it over DNS. But if you're trying to exfiltrate a bunch of data, DNS is not really what you want. You're not going to be able to put a lot in those packets um, and you can't because if DNS packets get above certain size thresholds, any kind of network monitoring security software is going to start triggering on that and say like, hey, I don't know why this, this DNS packet is 3000 bytes. That's a probably a bad thing. Are you, you tell um, me you guys don't store, you know, your whole, uh, <laughs> you don't transmit over DNS. That's not the most effective uh, protocol. I mean, it's not bad. I mean, if you want to do like some very simple C2, but when you need to go back and forth and transfer a bunch of uh, data and stuff, that's not where you want to be. You know, you want to be like John said, HTTP, HTTPS. Um, you know, a lot of stuff comes over that, you know, videos, if you're watching YouTube or Netflix or whatever, all that's coming over that kind of a pipe. So it's not going to stand out nearly as much. Um, right. And it's even less so now with everybody doing video chat and stuff, you know, hiding massive amounts of data a few years ago was really hard. You know, because like, you just like, why is this one machine sending tons of data? Now it probably just means somebody's on a Zoom. Yeah, I, I'm with the audience. I, I use Napster and LimeWire for my C2. It's guaranteed not to get flagged, right? You know, no, no, uh, no sarcasm nope. there at all. Nope. Uh, all right. So the big reveal, right? I, you know, if we were a, a high production environment, I'd have some like drum roll music added right, right about now. Yeah. But no drum roll. <laughs> add that in post. We got. It. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll add it in post. So boom, I mean, obviously you could imagine some of this is pandering to ourselves, but what was really neat is these actors considered these same things, not just about how they would do it, but when they would send it. So John, I know you had spent quite a bit on trying to understand not just the domain generation algorithm, which is unique in itself, it's pretty neat. And there was a lot of things that that domain generation algorithm 
allowed researchers to be able to attribute this back to individual, you know, networks. But can you start us with, you know, the DNS side of comms, what they were doing, how this was working? Yep. So they were, uh, the DNS comms was the initial outbound traffic. And so they were using it passively What the system or what the um, implant, for lack of a better term, would do, would be to encode the details about the host. In this case, the, uh, what they called a user ID, which was a combination of the MAC address, the domain name, oh, and I've got a typo, machine GUID, so they could have a unique identifier for the host. And they would send that out along with the rest of the DNS request, which would include the, the domain name. Because initially what they were looking for was they would collect the domain name to define targets of interest. So the, that would be encoded. So in the example at the bottom, um, it would call out to a known URL, but the top level domain or top level piece of it was uh, the encoded data. And that's how they would determine. So in, in that uh, example, the CIP, if when you decoded it, it would give the Windows domain of acme.internal and they would decide from there whether it was a target of interest or not. What was interesting is this, uh, if there was no, if the machine was not connected to a Windows domain, the implant shut down. It wouldn't beacon out because they didn't care about it. Now it's definitely neat, um, but uh, I know you had some stuff, John, you ready for me to move into the, like the response yeah. mapping side? Yeah, I was gonna say the only other piece to this is they actually had the security product status included inside the DNS requests as well, because they were looking for those um, a few of those items are the security products that they weren't uh, specifically targeting or trying to avoid. John, moving over, uh, obviously yeah. there was all kinds of things. Uh, you you want to share, you know, this is from the, the team at TrueSec, but uh, obviously it starts, show, you know, highlighting a whole lot. So what are we looking at with all these crazy network ranges and slash 24s? And So this is the response mapping of the DNS request. So they would send out the DNS request that would have information about the target, um, the details, the domain name, the, the user ID to uniquely identify the host. And then the response would come back and the response was essentially one of these three commands, uh, terminate, I'm not interested in looking at you anymore. So they would send a response with the IP address in that range and that correlated to uh, ATM implant terminate. The other option was to keep polling. So I'm not truly interested in you right now, but keep checking and I might come back to you later. And then the, the third one was this net BIOS result, which would say go to stage two and which brings on the HTTP comms. Yeah. Oh, it's funny. So some folks were asking, hey, would they have picked up Huntress as a security product? This is that double-sided sword where we went through and asked ourselves that same question earlier, right? Um, we were not in their process list. Does that mean we're too pathetic or we're too stealthy? I, it's probably a, a little of both on there, but good question, everyone. So, um, so John, you know, why would you have it? Obviously, you can start hypothesizing right away. Terminate means like scram. I did target validation. You're not worthwhile, you know, deuces. I'm not wasting my time on you. But stage two, right? I mean, this is where people start getting a little bit more interested. And I, oddly enough, or not oddly, I guess unsurprising, a lot of the folks on analysis, right? They were really keen or really interested in like, you know, um, what cool things were out there. So do you want to explain this? This is uh, that same TrueSec blog that we were looking at earlier, right, John? Yeah, and this is, yeah, this particular here is a list of some of those domains that were decoded and the TrueSec had results of the DNS requests and saw that these particular domains were issued the stage two or the net BIOS command. And so they, they started that HTTP beacon. Yep. So, uh, you know, on every article I read on this, and this is going to be is based on what I'm seeing on my slides, something went terribly wrong on the slide formatting in this next one. But uh, <laughs> let's see if it comes out. Oh, it does come out here. I'll fast forward it. <laughs> What's interesting is everybody talked about when they started deciphering those comms, they were like, look, this is in Cisco's network. Microsoft later came forward and said these actors got in and you know even got access to some source code. Uh, what's funny is nobody mentioned some of the, you know, it was like over 250 domains that appear to have been tasked with that NetBio stage two task. Is that correct, John? Yep. So uh, for instance, you know, some of those domains that, you know, there's questions on these 
because at the end of the day, it's the big question of where did these go to? They were internal domain names, so they don't necessarily you know, represent outside. But what's wild is we started seeing more and more analysis. It looks like there was many of them were major cloud service providers, right? Uh, and keep in mind, there's no validation from these companies yet. Um, but you start having to ask yourself, like, if I require, if I recall, XNet is definitely, you know, XNet in Kazakhstan. Like, there's not a whole lot to be confused with some of that domain. Obviously, there could be collisions, but, you know, that one's pretty minimal. But what's wild is you start digging in, there are just tons of these service providers that of the, if I recall, 18,000 folks received that DLL from Orion. But there was, you know, only a couple hundred that appeared to have received that second stage tasking. Yet of those couple hundred, along the sides of major companies are these you know, uh, cloud service providers. So it's definitely interesting to see how that happens. Um, going on, John, I think you had your next piece though of you know, what, what happens when this gets escalated? What happens when you get that NetBIOS request? Do you wanna share real quick about that combination of DNS and HTTPS? Yep. So the, yeah, like I said before, when the, they were a target of, selected as a target of interest, you would get that net BIOS result or response back in the DNS request. And that would initialize the HTTP comms, which uh, is starts running those tasks that are executed in that job function. So you can uh, get details about the host, run other tasks. What was interesting about this one is um, they actually used a regex to parse the response body. So in the next slide, I'll show you in a second, it, it would parse out details looking for um, Hex you, strings and they would decode that. So, are yeah, you okay you for me to move to it? Yeah. So, yeah, here's a request or courtesy of FireEye. Here's one of the results or responses. And basically, what they would do is the uh, implant would parse out the, the sections that are highlighted in red, join those together, and then decode those, which were the commands that were actually run by the implant. So getting data, executing other tasks, deleting files, et cetera. And this is how it communicated back and forth. So, uh, so Mike, not only were they using encrypted comms, but then their responses actually looked like solar winds. If you looked at it, it looks like solar winds details and they were just injecting the uh, pertinent pieces, uh, obfuscating them inside. So you, you wouldn't necessarily take a look closer you just saw it. Yep. So uh, Mike was asking um, if if something like a you know a DNS filter product, whether it's DNS filter of the company or Umbrella or WebRoot DNS filtering, anything like that, if they would have picked up this type of activity, um, that's something we were actually talking about earlier, before, just before this session. <laughs> yeah, before we got on. In, I don't know exactly how any of their infrastructure works, but in theory, they should be tracking that kind of stuff in their infrastructure, DNS requests and re associated responses. So in theory, um, they should have that kind of data. Obviously, it depends on what all of the victims were running, if they were running any kind of DNS filtering. But if, it, if one of the victims was running DNS filtering, they should be able to go back to those logs and figure out which machines uh, requested the domains, actually figuring out what was the data that was sent outbound and determining whether or not those machines got the second stage. Uh, so we have some of that data here, which seems to have come from like cache DNS uh, queries and stuff. But for anybody who was actually a victim, you should be able to get really high quality stuff so long as your DNS filtering captured it. Yeah, I'm actually surprised with us now, you know, what are we, a month you know, later? December 12th of SolarWinds notification to yep. January 12th here. I would expected all kinds of DNS companies to have come forward and been like, boom, this is what we have. Keep in mind, it's also con you know, company attributable because that hash right. can be broke. Then you could start making the same type of correlations we said earlier, like are these cloud service providers compromised? Cause it looks like it's going from this domain. So I, I can understand why they might not have done it, but there has been a bit of a void of anybody talking on that side of the house. I mean, yeah. guys, um, I did throw in chat, but we've had a handful of really good questions that have come up. And I know, you know, part of this, the actors at this stage, by the way, we've shown you all the fancy stuff. There was all kinds of beautiful techniques they did once they got in and kind of moved from the sunburst implant 
into teardrop and cobalt strike with some of the malware they used to, to move laterally. This presentation here wasn't meant to go dive into those. So I'm gonna keep it high level on the sunburst side. And if we want maybe a follow-up next month, like just light up chat. And we obviously have a quite a bit more to talk about on this. We're just limited to an hour today. Um, some of the awesome questions that came in, um, John uh, asked this question. This is John uh, Rakowski saying, yo, biggest question, are there elements of Orion in other products of Solar Winds? And guys, was this not our number one? Like I know while all kinds of everybody else was trying to attribute right, cracking hashes and figuring out who were the big companies compromised, our number one focus was holy crap, is it really just Orion or is it other things? And oddly enough, one of the people on this conversation, this is Kelvin, uh, and Kelvin said, look, Kyle, you've provided some of the indicators of compromise for this um, you know, DLL, the DLL that was backdoored within the first kind of couple hours that this was public. And he says, look, I use SolarWinds products. I actually found a DLL. Can you let me know, is this compromised? And so John, to answer your question directly, the public announcement and release from SolarWinds has been, there has been no other identified backdoored software except in the Orion build process. And Huntress, hell or high water, we looked in all kinds of crazy places. Tons of folks that were actually watched Tradecraft Tuesday helped us on this analysis. And we have found cases where that DLL, the same exact DLL that we were referencing, but non-backdoored versions are included in stuff like the uh, SolarWinds um, and Central Probe for Windows. The DLL is present, but in no cases has Huntress found a backdoored copy. Um, actually, in most cases, it was a very old version of the DLL. So maybe it was bundled at one time because it was used and, not, and no longer used. Um, but we have not, even though we have found elements of Orion in other SolarWinds products, our hypothesis at the moment is it probably just wasn't part of that build system that was being injected into with uh, Sunspot. So that's probably the, the reason that it didn't make it into other products. Chris, John, you know, that, that's a pretty official statement for us to have to give, um, especially because my next slide, I think, is we were lucky enough to get mentioned in the class action lawsuit against SolarWinds by name. Uh, you know, uh, so um, is that your guys' is, Yeah, is that... <laughs> Is that your guys the same, uh, you know, uh, theory on this of, of how did it not make it into the, you know, the other software? Seems like it. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm, I'm the same way. Um, next question. Is it common or is it easy for actors to spoof or steal a digital signature? And that's really two different questions, guys, right? Spoofing digital signatures, thankfully, because they are air quote cryptographically secure, as long as they're a modern digital signature, they're not built on MD5 or SHA-1, which are known to have crypto vulnerabilities. Most of them are SHA-256. And as a result, spoofing is not, I won't say not feasible, it's just not you know, likely, it doesn't happen. But guys, what are you, does somebody wanna take that second question of how common is it for us to see stolen digital signatures or other people's legitimate digital signatures do you want to give references to when we see it and maybe some of the previous examples? Yeah, I don't know how often we see it. I think John could probably better answer that, but I'm, it is a thing that does happen periodically where somebody will lose control of their signature and attackers can sign stuff. Um, it's not super common. Um, you know, your average everyday uh, skiddies and you know, these, these crappy hackers on these forums, they're not doing it because they don't have that kind of ability to actually you know, hack into somebody who has a cert, but you do see it from time to time. I don't know how much we actually see it. Yeah, I, don't, I, don't, I can't think of us seeing it very often. That I've yeah, seen a it's couple usually cases stolen where... gaming companies, you know, yep. you know, overseas gaming firms that are very small for whatever reason, they are very often targeted for their digital certificate. So even on some of our dark web demos that Huntress gives, we've actually found cases where hackers are on like the dark web selling stolen digital certificates to other people's stuff. Um, that's the only ones I can think of, John, that we've ever come across in Huntress, other than like supply chain problems. Like remember when uh, CCleaner, Crap Cleaner, and uh, when Puriform got acquired by Avast, that was another supply chain incident where actors got in, that software was signed by the legitimate Puriform certificate and deployed out to tons of people. The Asus Live Updater, 
That was another signed application that was pushed, but the attackers, once again, supply chain is most often where we see it, although stolen certificates happen. So uh, we guys, on this. we don't got a lot of time left. I, I got you. So, um, you know, we'll keep the questions coming in. Uh, I'm getting hungry. Wife is supposedly cooking me some cheese pizza. <laughs> I'm super curious, guys. What are your thoughts on attribution piece? Because we've got some really good questions that are in here, but uh, some of them even asked like, you know, are these attributable? Everybody's saying it, you know, it's Russia. There's been all kinds of stuff. Even some people getting specific of like um, Russian SVR. That's a, you know, a effectively intelligence apparatus in Russia. Yeah. Guys, uh, what, what's your two, you know, your, your, uh, your two shakes on it? I mean, FBI, CISA, ODNI, and the NSA also came out with a joint statement saying like, this was likely... Uh, Russia, um, Russian government. They didn't say 100%. They didn't say for sure. So hard to say what that exactly means there. But yeah, like you said, um, a bunch of people on Twitter have been talking about for a while that this was uh, Russian SVR. Um, and for anybody who's not up to date on all the different Russian intelligence agencies, um, you, you, the two big ones are the FSB and the SVR. FSB is generally like internal stuff, internal Russian things. So think of like FBI um, in the US. SVR is external, outside of the country, outside of Russia stuff. So think NSA. So that's yep. why a lot of people are thinking it's probably SVR because it appears to be espionage targeted at um, you know other countries, uh, technical industries and stuff like that. Yeah, I mean, I haven't seen a Russian press release, uh, but you know, one of the awesome questions that we asked as founders, and Mike uh, Parrot just asked it in chat, does attribution make a difference, right? I mean, to some folks, it does if you're able to, you know, maybe consider how does this affect like your national contracts? Maybe you decide to remove your presence of your business in certain countries, but I would challenge most of the mid market and below cares at the end of the day like are you are you gonna say you know shake my fist at you russia china whoever like no you, you at the end of the day you want to know what happened could you have done anything to prevent it something this elegant with actors of this skill level that clearly we're going to get in your job at this point really is to minimize right minimize the damage how can you quickly recover how could you i mean the biggest thing that most of the folks attending this are probably asking themselves is the question of how do I even convey this risk to my own clients, right? Do my service agreements even have me covered? Do they protect me, right? That's a lot of us in the, the mid-market at the end of the day. So I would choose or, and say that, hey, to a point, it does matter. You know, other folks have asked, like, it could matter to your cyber insurance policy at who's doing this because was it an act of war or an act of cyber war? These are still areas that we're getting challenged. But for many of us that are responding, you know, you're going to have to tailor it, uh, I'm not losing sleep if this was China, Russia, or some dude in their basement, albeit some skilled dude or woman in their basement. Um, I'm just not, uh, you know, losing sleep over that piece. Um, guys, what else? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely like the actors that burn off these networks. What's happened to the command and control servers, right? I think these are questions that haven't kind of come up, right? Um, you know, are there beaconing infrastructure? Do our audience still need to worry? Or do they have this implant in their network? Um, does anyone want to take a crack? I've got my own thoughts from reading Solar Winds articles, but I would love for somebody to maybe go first. Yeah, so it doesn't really seem so. Um, and somebody asked actually in chat earlier, how come um, any kind of DNS filtering did not pick up on a new domain name? Um, the reason for that is it's not a new domain name. So the domain that they, uh, the domain name that they used was an existing domain name with reputation. Uh, we're not entirely sure whether or not like it was allowed to expire and they registered it or if they were taken over. Like you see with some attackers where they'll compromise somebody else's like WordPress server or something and use that as their command and control. So in the case of like umbrella, DNS filter, any kind of those, they would look at it and say, oh, this is a domain that's been around for a while. It's not so new. So they've kind of passed that uh, newness check there. Um, but it looks like all of that is burned down. Um, you actually, according to uh, the Solar Winds blog post, they removed all of the stuff um, six months into the operation. I mean, back in like June of 2020, they removed the stuff. They stopped injecting 
um, solar burst uh, or sunburst into new installations, new builds that was all removed. Like they basically achieved their goal or some of their goals of getting access to places where they wanted. They escalated to the C2, which we talked about that before, depending on which uh, response you'd get to your DNS stuff, whether you terminate, um, go move on to stage two or not. And then they removed that. So they, and this is the difference between um, state sponsored activity and a lot of the stuff that we see with ransomware gangs and uh, the, you know uh, e-crime and stuff like that, where when they're running and pushing, whether it's Sodi Nikibi or our evil or anything like that, they want to get as many people as possible and just blast it out there because that gives them the best chance of making money. In this case, we see completely the opposite, where it's very heavily targeted to like large companies and large industry um, and stuff like that. And they're terminating and not dropping a second stage on any cases where they don't. And that's why you know that this is a very targeted campaign, which is almost always state sponsored. Yep. So uh, some folks had some questions with our last couple of minutes left. Obviously, this will probably be you know one of the final ones, but it's a good one. It's re in regard to you know whether you're a SolarWinds partner, customer, what does this mean to you at the end of the day? I mean, the bigger question Chris, John, and I asked ourselves before this presentation was, what could have somebody done to prevent this? And the reality is you're partnering with a publicly traded company. Even if you would have asked for like, let me see your SOC 2 compliance or let me see this, any type of reasonable customer request, what would you have got? You would have got the answer, which would have been, of course, you know, we've passed it this time and the other. It's to a point, this is just part of accepting some of your risk. That doesn't mean you need to accept the problem here. You know, but part of it is who are you partnering with? And I don't know, you know, a lot of people swirled around that whole solar winds one, two, three bang, uh, you know, was that password? Clearly that was used and abused to the FTP server. Was that in the initial foothold or was that just an example of the one of many bugs that creep up in anybody's IT network? I would argue that was low hanging fruit and it probably should have been two factor password, no excuse for them. But uh, I mean, at the end of the day, like this is part of the attack surface. Um, you know, you're going to have to scrutinize, does your vendor take a security first approach? Do they have people that live, eat and breathe? And even as Huntress is getting bigger ourselves, we have to ask ourselves, how do we not suck in the future, right? How do we not let this happen? Or when Huntress does get pwned, what type of firewalls, what type of segmentation can we do to our own network to prevent this from either deploying? How can we change like, you know, our signing process doesn't have an automated certificate signing. John literally has a physical token that he is using on his signing process. Every time we go to release a piece of software, we've disconnected those. So if it does get compromised, there would be, this is not signed from hunters, but you know, that becomes that question of how can you do like, it's just hard. And I, what I want to do is really bring it down into the, uh, the level of like, look, there's all kinds of stuff. It sounds like based on the amount of like direct questions we're getting to just panelists here that next month we'll have to change maybe the Tradecraft Tuesday agenda and focus on what happened after these attackers got in the network. They did some really cool stuff on bypassing two-factor. They did some really cool stuff on how they targeted email. We can go into that for our next month episode, but I will leave you with this thing of at the end of the day, patch your software. SolarWinds is obviously now to the point where they have packages that are trying to remove the backdoor stuff, have an incident response firm, all the stuff we've been saying for 20 plus years. People had asked me, you know, the end of 2020, what are your projections that you want to give your partners for 2021? Or what are your predictions for 2021? It's the same old stuff that you should have had in place in 2010, that, you know, the same processes of how to follow this up. So guys, people had asked, does Huntress monitor for these threats? I mean, obviously, not only were we monitoring as soon as we got notice, we've even built custom monitors looking, but you'll have anybody tell you this now. Every vendor under the sun will be like, we'll help prevent you from that zero day. Keep in mind, one of the first things that I shared with everybody was, you know, even a couple of days after this, one out of 70 of the vendors and nobody from 2019 till 2020, not a single great provider, whether it's Huntress, a CrowdStrike, a Sentinel One, everybody was goose egg on this stuff. This is the reality of what top tier nation state actors, what John, Chris and I used to do. So um, I, I hope that brings it back down into like real world, um, you know, how this plays in. Guys, you wanna, you know, just for, you know, we're right at the top of the hour. We're gonna be in some places. Do you wanna leave it with some, you know, final, you know, moments of where to find us? Cause I think we're helping yes. a CTF that's going on. But Chris, do yep. you wanna take that piece? 
Yeah, we have uh, CTF and cigars. I'm going to post all of this um, in the chat. So we'll be there uh, January 14th. We're helping out with that, which should be cool. If you're into CTFs, definitely show up. Um, we're also doing uh, IoT SSA uh, cyber stream, and that is going to be on January 20th. And then for anybody who's also going to be there, um, SMB Tech Fest on January 21st. So uh, those are the places we're going to be. If you're there, come by, say hi, uh, say what's up. And uh, yeah, really, thanks for hanging out with us this last hour. A um, lot of stuff that we covered, a lot more that we had to skip because we just didn't have time. So yep. like yeah, I said, you... next month. Yeah, we'll have more. And, uh, you know, if those of you that want to share this with your, you know, coworkers, the goal for us is to get this uh, recording. It is being recorded up on the web, whether it gets pulled off of YouTube again, or we finally have the new video hosting up this month. Either way, the recording will be available and we'll send a follow up afterwards for your coworkers. So huge thanks for everybody helping us kick off the new year. We really appreciate you showing up for Tradecraft Tuesday. I think we'll see you next month, everyone. Yep. Yep. See ya. See ya.